Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. This is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Governor Murphy unveils a nearly $45 billion budget laying out his election year priorities as we claw our way out of this pandemic, delivering the fourth and final budget address of his first term, painted brighter thanks to better than expected revenues and with big promises for the year ahead, a historic pension payment made with no new taxes and money for most of the groups competing for cash. But what's behind the fine print? Our senior correspondent, Brenda Flanagan, reports. This is the time to move New Jersey forward. And that is what this budget does. Standing in an empty theater because of COVID, Governor Murphy unveiled a $44.8 billion spending plan that aims to both help heal the economic pain wrought by the pandemic and boost his political juice as he and State House Democrats seek re-election in November. Murphy's proposed budget for 2022 does not raise any taxes, fees, or transit fares for residents still reeling from the ongoing pandemic, but appropriates 10% more than the last fiscal budget, offering multiple tax breaks for families, seniors, and veterans. This budget lives up to our stronger and fairer mission. Stronger to come out of the pandemic with an economy that works for every New Jersey family. And fairer to help families and small businesses hit hard and left behind in the pandemic's brutal wake. The governor's got money to spend with better than expected tax revenues in hand, plus $4 billion borrowed last year to offset projected pandemic-related losses, $2 billion in federal COVID aid, and possibly billions more incoming from a new congressional relief package. He's looking to soothe financial sore points like escalating property taxes, which topped $9,000 on average for the first time ever last year. To help ease that burden, Murphy offered the usual property tax rebates. He doesn't increase municipal aid, but proposes spending nearly $600 million more in school formula aid, $9.26 billion, after holding that funding flat last year. Every dollar in new state funding is a dollar that doesn't have to be placed on the shoulders of local property taxpayers. Big ticket priorities include $6.4 billion, the first full payment into the state's public pension system since 1996, certain to please union members. Payments have been steadily ramping up, but this payment comes a year ahead of schedule, a result of those better than expected revenues. Making the payment is keeping our word to hundreds of thousands of retirees who depend on their pensions. The governor offered a broad menu of other tax relief items for different constituents. They include tax rebates of up to $500 for New Jersey single parent families earning 75,000 or less or two parent households making 150,000 or less, part of a deal brokered during the millionaires tax negotiations last summer. Because of this, not only have we secured the resources to invest even more deeply into our communities, we're able in this budget to provide checks totaling nearly $320 million in direct tax rebates to hundreds of thousands of working and middle class New Jersey families. And there's more, a broader earned income tax credit eligibility for seniors without dependents, an expanded property tax deduction for vets who serve during peacetime, and an enhanced child and dependent care credit that helps pay child care costs by making it refundable and expanding income eligibility from sixty dollars to $150,000. And for many families, and most especially for New Jersey women, this expansion will make your tax credit bigger to allow you to recoup more of the costs of child care. NJ Transit wouldn't raise fares, but the agency would keep on cannibalizing its own capital budget and relying on transfers from the Clean Energy Fund to pay day-to-day -day expenses. There is more money to upgrade old computers aimed at improving unemployment claim processing at the Department of Labor and transactions at the Motor Vehicle Commission. Two areas in particular where the pandemic exposed shortcomings. Too many people across New Jersey 
paid the price for that long-standing neglect. So this is my simple, clear message. New Jersey is done kicking problems down the road. We are solving them. Republicans predictably fumed over the governor's spending priorities. Governor Murphy believes that the solutions for New Jersey is more programs, more government spending. He believes that government is the solution. The whole budget is kind of a scam. And, I, and the most offensive part was the smoke and mirrors, because this is a smoke and mirrors budget. To, be, to, to have that kind of borrowing. We could have paid the bills without that additional borrowing. It's surprise, surprise. It's a uh, an election year uh, and the governor's running for re-election. This budget is 29% higher than when uh, the governor took off uh, over from Governor Christie. But Republicans face a Democratic trifecta in Trenton. Now begins the months-long series of budget public hearings before lawmakers with a June 30th budget deadline. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. In fact, some Republican lawmakers are proposing a special session to get this massive budget approved earlier and money out to struggling businesses and families sooner. The proposed spending is about 10 percent more than last year's budget. Of course, the pandemic wasn't in our sights then. And even with all this extra cash, there's no plan to roll back the new taxes that previous budget created to get us here. Our budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer and business correspondent Rhonda Schaffler walk us through the details. Let's talk about the surplus. Let's talk about exactly where this is going uh, with $45 billion on the table. Yeah, so that's about 10% uh, higher than the appropriations that were approved for the prior, to, well, what's the current fiscal year? So the current fiscal year runs through the end of June. What we're talking about in the new budget will be in place from the beginning of July all the way till the end of June of 2022. And so uh, year over year, when you talk about 12 months spending, what lawmakers approved versus what they, they would be asked to approve in this budget, it's up about 10%, a little more than that, which is a big amount. And you know we're gonna end the current fiscal year with a lot of budget reserves, New Jersey's never in that position. New Jersey is always kind of patching it and making it go with very meager reserves. But between the borrowed money, the unexpected uh, tax collections, and as Rhonda mentioned, we still have a potential to receive some federal uh, dollars that would free up even more state resources. Uh, there's a good portion of surplus that will actually be spent down in FY22 under what the governor's proposed. And that will leave about 5% in reserves, uh, about the amount that Murphy's administration has maintained. But New Jersey's always knocked for having very slim reserves. And if you remember when this downturn caused by coronavirus began, funding for things like the Homestead Property Tax Relief uh, right. uh, benefit was, was pulled back altogether because we didn't have enough money in reserves to absorb the losses. So that's a key issue to keep an eye on going forward. Yeah, let's hit on those pension contributions. This would be, Rhonda, the first time in 25 years that this full payment would be made since 1996. How is this going to work? Well, you know, first of all, it is significant. So that $6.4 billion payment um, makes a big difference. Of course, we could debate what happens in future budgets. Uh, where will the money come from? But that's for another day. Um, it's significant to try to get the pension system on firmer ground, keep in mind, when New Jersey is knocked by the credit agencies, they always bring up this underfunded pension issue. So it's significant, but as John pointed out, you know, we have the resources in this budget, thanks to those revenues coming in better than expected and the borrowing. So there was a pathway to make this happen, but it is significant and I'm going to be curious to see if it is noted on Wall Street from the credit rating agencies. Yeah, John, no mention there of paying down uh, our bonded debt, uh, but there is some relief in store, it looks like, for some property taxpayers, yes? Yeah, and uh, un underscoring what Rhonda said on uh, pensions, it, it, would it would be amazing if they, if they didn't come up with the resources to make that contribution given w what, what they have in Treasury right now. And, and turning to direct property tax relief, you know, there's, there's over a billion in this budget and, and Murphy said property taxes about 10 different times during the speech, which uh, is not surprising given this is a re-election year. Uh, one thing that is worth noting, uh, some of the line items are actually held flat 
or even going down when it comes to property tax relief. Senior freeze, a very popular program is held flat, so that means um, no growth. And Homestead is actually ticking down a little bit because Treasury is keeping, again, or the Murphy administration, income limits for that program static. And they also continue to use bills that were assessed in 2006 to calculate the benefits that Homestead recipients get. So that's seniors, disabled residents, and homeowners with incomes under 75,000. Uh, and, and so uh, we'll have to see uh, about that going forward. Lawmakers are up for reelection this year too. Uh, property taxes just grew to an all-time high last year, and yet this homestead benefit remains static. So that means what people are receiving is not keeping pace with the bills they're getting, which to some people would amount to a tax hike. Yeah, $9,000, I believe, was the property tax bill. Rhonda, John mentioned, again, it is an election year. These are election year priorities. Um, do some of these other factors, some of these other items then factor into that, these other groups that are going to be getting money? Well, it, it's interesting. I mean, now is when the debate begins in terms of where should money be invested. Just to pull out a few things, and you heard so many uh, during that speech, there's the money for small businesses, money to help Main Street. Now, we could get more money from the federal government that might help shore that up. You heard all this year Governor Murphy talking about the green economy. He's putting some money into that with the offshore wind project that was announced recently in South Jersey. So that's a direct allocation. And I would be remiss if we didn't talk about all of these unemployed workers in New Jersey. There is some money committed to job and workplace training. Is it going to be enough? That might be a point of argument among lawmakers in an election year to get these um, residents off the unemployment rolls, get them trained, get them into new jobs, especially if our economy starts to pick up. It looks, though, largely like Governor Murphy has avoided some of the painful spending cuts that we were all talking about back in August when he presented uh, the revised budget. I want to mention some of the other um, new items that the, the governor brought up. Garden State Guarantee, John, this is looking to fund uh, first two years of college for students, eligible students at four-year colleges and universities, cover NJ kids' health care, maternal health, um, all priorities that we've heard the governor talk about really throughout the last several years, last few years. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think Murphy has done anything that people would accuse him of, uh, you know, sending mixed signals. I think this budget represents to a T the types of things that he's always uh, advocated for. And, and he said in the speech, I counted, um, let's see, uh, almost 20 times he said the word investment, which is another kind of Mur Murphy catchphrase, right? Taxes have been uh, increased throughout his tenure. And he's always couched that as to support investments. And I think that's how we should look at what this proposal is. Uh, certainly none of the tax hikes that came amid the emergency circumstances of a few months ago are being rolled back. So all of that funding is coming into the treasury. And Murphy is absolutely saying he wants to make investments in things like college education, community college education, maternal health, a, a lot of the areas that you know he's made no secret about emphasizing in the past. Yeah, and school funding gets a slight boost there as well. Is that right, Rhonda? Yes, you do see an increase there. And I would say it is quintessential Governor Murphy's stronger and fairer economy. I mean, there's no real surprises in terms of some of these um, ideas and where his commitment is. What's going to be interesting is to see where does the pushback come from? Because the governor doesn't just present a budget and everyone says, great, we're down with everything in here. So we know there's going to be a little bit of pushback. You know, Governor Murphy's saying that property tax increases have uh, risen at the smallest percentage compared to prior governors. Well, people don't really want that. They want more property tax relief. Um, the business community, certainly there was a corporate business tax surcharge that did not get reversed. So there might be some pushback there. Um, but in terms of spending priorities, I think we got what we would expect from the governor. All right, Rhonda Schaffler, John Reitmeyer, we'll be talking to you later. Thanks so much.
With a November election just ahead, Murphy does stand to benefit if the legislature agrees to his spending. From organized labor to progressive groups, there's a little something for everyone. These proposals will likely become both his best and worst enemy going into campaign season. Our senior writer Colleen O'Day takes a look at the politics behind the numbers. Colleen, I guess, does this make sense during an election year, these priorities, uh, to hammer on some of these key words that John Reitmeyer counted for us, thankfully, during that speech? Yeah, you know, I'll just echo what everyone else has said, which is clearly this is a uh, an election year budget. Um, there's an awful lot of politics in what we heard. Um, you know, talking about property tax relief is always something that uh, governors are going to stress in New Jersey because our taxes are so high here. Um, but there were a number of things in this um, address that were quite surprising that are not um, the typical Phil Murphy, stronger and fairer, you know, kind of liberal progressive um, discussion that we hear from him. Um, he talked about, you know, they've always looked for savings. Uh, they looked for efficiencies as Senator Orho mentioned, that government is smaller than when we took office, and you know maybe the most shocking was the um, that they're they're changing or somehow doing away with some um, rules regarding DEP and other permits that will make um, the process smoother and faster. I mean, those kinds of things are always things we've heard from a Republican governor. So it certainly seemed to me that this speech was meant to um, attract people beyond the typical Democratic base that the governor, you know, has certainly gotten a lot of support from. Yeah, and, and let's be clear here, too, in this Democratic-controlled legislature, um, Senator Sweeney and the Assemblyman uh, Speaker Craig Coughlin have made it clear, you know, they're not going to go for new taxes. They weren't going to go for some of those proposals that maybe Murphy would have tried for previously. Um, so in that sense, it, it's a bit moot. Right. So the, um, the, the this new tax program that we heard about to families with children only came about as a um, part of a bargaining chip over the millionaire's tax that actually we did get passed last year. Um, the, you know, they wouldn't stand for it without that kind of support. And the governor wanted that. Remember, he, he had proposed this baby bonds kind of program last year that didn't go through, but this was kind of a, um, you know, an alternative to that. Well, and Colleen, let me ask you quickly about those rebates that are set to go out this summer, about $320 million total, a sliding scale. What can you tell us about that quickly? Right. So those are going to go to its families with children, um, you know, low, the lower income, the, the higher your benefit would be. And, um, you know, the Republicans have kind of termed it, you know, a, a, a kind of payment, right, to, to maybe get more people to vote for the governor, that's, you know, that's certainly a cynical way to look at it. Um, you know, that was the same kind of language was used when we talked about the stimulus payments um, from the federal government, although that didn't help Donald Trump last year. So, you know, who knows how that's gonna land politically, um, but it is definitely targeted and it's meant to, to go to the folks who need help the most. And of course that hasn't been funded just yet. All right, Colleen O'Day, thank you for your insight. No details today, but of course, tax revenue from legal weed could change the state's near future finances. With minutes to spare Monday, Governor Murphy ended the three-year stalemate over the proposal, signing key bills making a recreational marijuana program official in New Jersey. But that doesn't mean you can go out today and legally buy the drug. It'll take months, maybe even longer, to get licensed dispensaries up and running. What should you expect next? Joanna Gagas reports. It clearly def redefines marijuana as no longer a criminal substance in New Jersey. After years of hashing it out and a deadline day deal, lawmakers have finally found a way to legalize marijuana, making New Jersey the 13th state in the nation to do so. Governor Murphy says the passage is a huge step forward for social justice. New Jersey's broken and indefensible marijuana laws which permanently stained the records of many residents and short-circuited their futures, and which disproportionately hurt communities of color and failed the meaning of justice at every level, social or otherwise, are no more. 
The package of bills the governor signed yesterday accomplishes three things. It legalizes use for adults 21 and up, decriminalizes up to six ounces of marijuana, and a sticking point that nearly imploded the negotiations, it creates a series of penalties for underage use. It would be treated more like cigarettes than anything else. Uh, and um, I, I anticipate that in the, the time to come that it'll become more mainstream and a lot less people in the criminal justice system, which is what we want for things that really don't belong there. The attorney general issued new guidance yesterday to dismiss all pending charges for those who've been arrested but whose cases haven't yet been heard by the courts. And new guidance for police who can no longer make a stop just for the smell of weed. Reverend Charles Boyer says issues like expungement need to be handled quickly and retroactively, going back at least 10 years. There should be some type of uh, uh, executive order and some directive from the attorney general, which really puts out guidance and restricts how uh, any of this information can be used from a civil rights standpoint, uh, employment, things like housing. The state still has to form a cannabis regulatory commission. That'll have six months to organize before it can start accepting license applications. Diana Wainu, a woman of color, will chair the commission. The next chapter is opening up this market where we're gonna to start to see the development of a micro grow program. We're gonna to start to see the development of smaller license opportunities and the ability for smaller folks to get capital. The micro grow program is intended to bring people into the industry from quote, impact zones, urban communities most impacted by the war on drugs, and to avoid what's happened in the medical marijuana rollout where large, mostly white, out of state companies are dominating the market. The devil's in the details, says Boyer. Even amongst the micro licenses, the financial barriers are still very high for the person who was selling on the streets in the underground market. And let's be very clear, people don't grow up and say, I want to be a drug dealer and I just want to do this just because. It's an issue of poverty. And so when you have financial barriers to come into the market, all you're doing is exacerbating that. The state will tax at 7%, with more than half the revenue going toward those impact zones. Boyer would like to see municipalities use their portions of the tax to invest in small business training programs that will help pull people off the corner and on to Main Street. Give them the dollars necessary to bring them into the market. They are the best ones to be in the market. They already have a clientele. They know how to run the business. Give them the structures and supports to bring them into the legalized, uh, regulated market. A market that still needs to be staffed and structured. So while it might be legal, don't expect to buy your weed legally anytime soon. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. And we'll speak one-on-one -on -one with the main sponsor of the legal marijuana bill, Senator Nick Scutari, live Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. on Chatbox. I'll be filling in for senior correspondent David Cruz. Then we'll take a deeper look at the guidelines and clashes around school reopening. Send your questions ahead of time to chatbox at njspotlightnews.org and watch it on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. Elsewhere tonight, the struggle to secure a vaccine appointment wages on as shipments delayed by the winter weather slowly trickle in at local county and mega sites across the state. The call center is still working out kinks with training and software glitches, and the Department of Health says there's no hard date for agents to begin scheduling appointments for residents. As of this morning, more than 1.7 million shots have been put in arms, more than half a million second doses. New Jersey's own Johnson & Johnson is ready to give the rollout a boost. The pharmaceutical company says it can deliver 20 million doses of its single-shot coronavirus vaccine to the U.S. government by the end of March. That's assuming J&J is granted emergency use approval from the FDA. The panel could give the green light as early as this weekend. The announcement comes less than a week after White House officials cautioned J&J's initial supply would be limited, but a spokesperson for J&J says the company is confident it'll meet the agreement of delivery delivering 100 million doses by the end of June. This as the U.S. death toll climbs to the highest in the world, more than 500,000 lives lost. President Biden marking the grim milestone with a candlelight ceremony Monday evening. Here at home, the rate of new infections is improving, with 2,500 new positive tests reported statewide today and another 104 lives lost. 
The city of Newark is a big part of that progress. For the first time since the summer, Newark's COVID-19 positivity rate is lower than the state's, now down to 9.95 percent. That's based on a three-day rolling average that ended February 15th. Meanwhile, the statewide average sits at 10.8 percent. It was a tough road to get there. You'll recall Mayor Roz Baraka putting in place curfews for city residents and harsher restrictions on businesses than the rest of the state. Those decisions followed a 21 percent positivity rate in November, which was nearly twice the state's at the time, and the East Ward of Newark was even higher at 41 percent. Since then, the mayor says those restrictions worked, businesses have been able to increase indoor capacity, and there's been a bigger push to roll out vaccines in the community. Before we go, we'll look at Wall Street today. The tech sell-off continues while the Dow wipes out a 360-point loss. Here's a look at the trading numbers. Well, that does it for us tonight, but head over to njspotlightnews.org or any of our social channels to continue following our reporting. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire news team. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than a hundred years and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.